Good morning and welcome to yet another Frog Live Radio. I'm Mike Howie on behalf of Frog Recruitment. Today it's my utter pleasure to welcome Vaughan Davis to our show. Now Vaughan started his professional life as a pilot with the Royal New Zealand Air Force. And like any good Air Force pilot, he did the obvious thing and moved into advertising and the creative department of advertising at that. Now after a long and impressive career in especially direct advertising, Vaughan is now, to use his own words, having no end of fun with social media. In fact, Vaughan has had so much fun thus far with social media that last year he produced an e-book called Tweet This Book, How to Build Your Business and Personal Brand Through Social Media, which I might add has been downloaded over 24,000 times. Now, keeping one foot in the traditional world of advertising, Vaughan was also invited in 2010 to be a judge on the direct jury at the Cannes Lion International Advertising Festival. And this is what one of Vaughan's clients says of Vaughan. Vaughan's ability to walk in the shoes of customers and tell it like it is to the client is engaging and builds an honest trust that defines him and his approach. So telling it like it is today, welcome Vaughan Davis from the Goat Farm. Good morning, Vaughan. Hey, Mike. How are you? Very, very well. Now, we've got a lot to get through today because you're a man who... Um, knows a lot about this new fandangled thing called social media. But look, can we, we always ask our guests this first question. Can you tell us your first job where you actually received payment, whether it be 50 cents or a bottle of Fanta? What was it and where was it? Absolutely. First, interesting you're saying the transition from uh, Air Force pilot to advertising was abrupt. The, uh, the transition from uh, evening post newspaper delivery boy to Air Force pilot was something of a, uh, something of a switch as well. I guess you could say I've, I actually started my career in media. Did you start your career in media? You saw a wonderful answer. What part of, was it Wellington or where was it? Yeah, in the Hutt Valley, the, di the dirty old hut. Good old Hutt Valley, love it. Bad mm. winters, but nice place, nice hills. Yeah. Now, the R is it the R N Z A F? Am I am I pronouncing that correctly? Yes, you are. We're In the right order today, of words. The, 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 the rate that things have been cut from the defence force, uh, they might have uh, chopped a couple of letters off that uh, overnight. I'd have to check. <laughs> so tell me what you did. Just give us a, a quick once over, because this is fascinating for us on on the ground. Yeah, I um, had had a, a sort of a charmed career really. I, I joined straight from school as a, as a 17 year old and the Air Force was pretty clever. They put me into a thing called the um, University Officer Cadet Scheme and there's sort of two aspects of that. F firstly it's, uh, it's for people like, you know, they identify as being potential leaders of the organisation uh, as it turned out none of us did. We all left so they, they, they sort of canned the scheme after a couple of decades but uh, what it also did is gave me a uh, a few years to you know go to university for three years um, you know in uniform, which is a, a different story um, and and see that there was sort of life outside the cockpit so you know I, I, I learned a lot, made a lot of good friends, and then went and did my did my pilot's course so it was a uh, it was a great opportunity and the question us men want to ask is did you actually fly fly a fighter jet? Oh, not really. No, we all we all trained on uh, we, we we trained on the little air trainers to start with, and then uh, because we did have jets in those days, I, I trained on a thing called the Strike Master, which was a uh, a two seat. Um, you could call it a fighter jet if you were being really really generous, or perhaps if you were writing the uh, the advertising brochure for the uh, for the Strike Master. But really, it was just a, a sort of a Morris Oxford with um, a, a small jet engine and, uh, and and stubby wings. So a lot of a lot of leather, a lot of Bakelite, uh, a lovely old aeroplane smell. It was fun. Oh, it sounds beautiful. Now, tell me, how does a does a, a pilot end up in in the creative end of advertising as well? Can you just give us a, your 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 the bridge from from uh, from from the air to the ground in the creative world? Thanks. Yeah, it's an it's an interest, it was an interesting transition because uh, I mean, what what spurred it uh, was I, I was at the point in my Air Force career where the next logical step would be to become an instructor. And I had no problem with that. I mean, as a, um, as a captain on, a, on the C-130 Hercules, you do a lot of sort of informal instructing and mentoring of your, of your co-pilots. Uh, problem is, uh, with the um, you know, defence cutbacks even then, um, instructing was sort of relocated to a Harkia, so I had no, no desire at all to live in a Harkia. Didn't want to be an airline pilot and um, sort of, really went through a fairly methodical um, examination of you know, what I liked and what I was into and the things I'd done over the last 10 years 
and, and out of the bottom of that came came two options. Right, I thought I could be a journalist, uh, you know, because writing is my strength in, in advertising. I could be a journalist or go into advertising, and I pretty quickly realised that uh, you're going to be you're going to be poor forever if you're a journalist. So advertising it was. Right, and, t- and just give us a, the, myself and the listeners a bit of a once over on the type of campaigns, especially the ones you're very proud of, that because you, you're you you were a copywriter to start with. But what sort of what we, would we know you from? Yeah, um, yeah. I started as a copywriter and then um, you know moved into into sort of more um, creative leadership positions, finishing as a, a creative director at a large agency. Um, I, I, I mean, I'm proud of everything we we ever did. You know, um, if I you know um, if I wrote you know you won't beat a Bond's deal you know, for Bond and Bond and, and and more people you know come and buy televisions and and, and toasters, that, that that's something to be proud of. But at a at a I guess more strategic and memorable level. Um, a campaign that I didn't initiate but worked on for ten years was the uh, New Zealand elections campaign. So you know the orange guy. Um, yeah, yeah, went out u- well. Unifying what at the time was three quite diverse uh, electoral brands. So there's electoral commission, the chief electoral office, uh, the electoral enrolment centre, and as far as the the public's concerned now, it's just one sort of smiling orange happy face. And working on that campaign over three elections, we you know between us and the client and the, the goodwill of the New Zealand public. We got New Zealand to 95.5% um, enrolled, which is something to be absolutely proud of, and we, we should be proud of that as a nation. Uh, but to, you know, to had a small part in that was was brilliant. And in fact, uh, I'm, I'm still working on on that campaign on the social media side. So he's um, recently kicked off on uh, on Facebook, so you can uh, you can engage engage with the orange guy uh, on your laptop now, which is cool. All right. Well, we'll hear more about that now. Just before we move into the present. Can you tell us quickly about what won the Direct Khan Lion Award? Because that sounds fascinating. That's obviously Khan France. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. That, that was that was an absolutely fascinating process. So I was one of uh, I think around thirty uh, advertising creatives from around the world, who, while everyone else was sort of walking up and down in the sunshine on the beach, uh, including my wife. Uh, we were inside a dark conference room for five days going through around 1,200 entries to find um, the world's best. It was, a, it was an interesting process. But last year, the world's best was uh, a New Zealand campaign. So we're very very proud to um, to award that to um, the Orcon Iggy Pop campaign. You know, remember where you got uh, got a bunch of musicians together, um, you know, from around New Zealand and collaborated and, and made a track. So that was a, that was a, that was a, a good feeling. And can you remember what, for people like marketers that are listening, what were the values of that campaign or the the, the positives that both you as a local obviously uh, liked, but the, that foreign ju- judges, what grabbed them? I think it's a, a trend that's coming through advertising a lot. It's um, it was a product demonstration, so it was um, which is sort of back to the future, really. It's you know where a lot of advertising began, rather than just making an ad that says you're great. Uh, all took the, the opportunity to use their own technology, you know, take their own medicine and demonstrate they're great by, you know, using fast broadband and hooking these people up uh, around the country and across to Iggy Pop in, in Miami. I mean, word, word is that the, uh, <laughs> as often happens, the uh, the actual uh, the event on the day didn't didn't go quite as smoothly as, as I'd hoped. But uh, you know, Khan is an, an ideas festival. It's not necessarily about practicality or, practicality or execution. And I, and I used to get a bit. Um, I suppose a bit cynical about the whole advertising award business, but then uh, I had a bit of a mind shift and, and decided that it's, it's sort of like uh, analogous to catwalk fashion, you know, just because um, something you see on the on the catwalk in, in Paris or uh, at the uh, you know New Zealand Fashion Week is, is sort of you know grotesque and unwearable, uh, that doesn't mean you should write it off because you'll see echoes of these things and echoes of the ideas turning up in glasses and posty plus and, and the warehouse two years later. So it, it's it's important to to push the boundaries in that way, and awards so sort of celebrate about, that thinking. Yeah, yeah. So talking about echoes of the future, you now find yourself as a and I would say a, 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 one of the leading pundits in the country on all things social media. What really what what drew you to this? What was your instinct telling you? Um, to get involved a couple of years ago. Well, I, I, I have to say it wasn't, it wasn't instinct um, because, I mean, as uh, someone working in advertising and media, I knew it was my job to uh, investigate and engage with everything new that came along. Um, you know, it, it, we sort of, we, we do that for our clients. So, um, you know, 
to, to be one step ahead of the clients and to to uh, to be able to you know, make a judgment on whether these channels are useful for them is a really really important role you can do as an advertising partner. So really, my my forays into you know Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and uh, YouTube and all those things weren't they didn't begin with uh, an instinct or a passion. That it was really just a methodical search as to you know what's coming down the tube and uh, and and what's useful. But I pretty quickly realised, uh, especially for Twitter. So this is, this is a pretty powerful uh, channel that sort of changed the relationship between brands and consumers, and that's what got me really excited. Okay, so look, you were, pretend I'm one of your old clients, a big, not say, uh, you know, multinational or a big, or a, a big mover. What would yeah. your answer be to the two, these two questions? What is social media, Vaughan, and why should I do social media? Yeah, I mean, so you can define social media a lot of ways, and a lot of people sort of define it fairly mechanically. If you look at the uh, the Wikipedia definition, uh, which has probably changed since the last time I looked at it, that's it's it's kind of nonsense. But sort of qualitatively, uh, for me, social media is where brands are equivalent to people. Um, and what I mean by that, and I'm obviously coming at this from a from a marketing perspective, but it means that uh, the old model of you know. You, know, you, you you run an ad on the TV and everyone talks about it and you know they trot down your shop and buy your product. Uh, it still exists, but it's being it's being overtaken by a model where you know you can you can have a discussion. I can have a discussion on an equal footing with with telecom or in New Zealand or um, or McDonald's or whoever because the, the social media enables that. Uh, and the, the challenge and opportunity, of course, for brands is to uh, to learn how to behave in that space and you know and to and to, to build their business while they're doing it. And it's it's, it's an exciting time. So before we go on, I read in your, and I will give uh, listeners um, all the key uh, information to, to download your, your book, uh, but you talk about advertising as a wall, not a window, which is a, quite a negative definition from someone in the industry. And a yeah, walls and windows. Tell us, tell us about what you mean. Yeah, and this, this was a, a thing I was thinking about a lot last year. It was um, how, how social media changes the relationship between people and companies and also how it can change uh, the culture of a company, which you know, to, certainly to your you know, HR and recruitment audience could be sort of quite interesting. And, and it, it goes like this. Advertising um, can be seen as, as pretty much uh, a process of finding a, a great big wall that everyone can see, uh, getting some paint and painting your message, uh, your promise, your brand uh, as, as brightly and as boldly on that wall as you can. Uh, and the way people perceive the brand is, is to an extent driven by what's on the wall and uh, you know how well you've painted it. What social media does is punches a whole lot of windows in that wall so people can actually see into your brand. Um, the, the flow of information is no longer controlled by the, uh, you know, the PR department or the, the marketing director or whatever. Uh, there, there is the opportunity, you know, for, for, for better or for worse, for everyone on the outside to connect and often connect quite publicly with everyone on the inside. Uh, and that's, that's really given, uh, I, think, I think it's made a lot of companies think about, uh, you know, um, the implications of that. And for me, the, the biggest implication is really exciting. It, you know, you could, you could down, go down the road of controlling that information saying no one shall talk on social media. Or... You could accept that it's going to happen and think, okay, what are the consequences for my company? And the consequences are you've got to make sure everyone in your company knows who you are, what you're about, what you're doing, why you're there, what your purpose is, all those good things. And when you think about it, these are, these are just the things that good companies should always have been doing. But social media sort of um, you know, gives, gives a bit of a, uh, an added and uh, sometimes acute reason for that, uh, for that to happen. And I think it's really cool. And it, it's, uh, it's sort of a, the intersection of... Uh, Marketing media and, uh, and and company culture, and it's pretty exciting. But isn't so if I if I could if I could put the negative hat on for a second, isn't it a bit wild west? Because when you and I spoke the other day, preparing for this interview, we both mentioned uh, well, I mentioned Marcus Lush. He had a horrible problem last year where someone set up a Facebook page um, in his name, uh, and you had some examples. But do you think it's a threat to some? Do you think some people? I mean, what can they do? This is the. Would you agree? Is it the wild west? Oh, it absolutely is the wild west. And of course, you know, the, I've been at a uh, conference in, here in Auckland called Netui in the last couple of days, and, and one of the big things we've been talking about is the balance between um, freedom of expression and freedom of speech, and the need for regulation and, and protecting people. Uh, 
you know, and you've got issues like you know Facebook is, is housed in, in California, and uh, you know, and, and, and Twitter's offshore, and do the laws of you know do the laws of this country apply to, to um, social platforms that aren't there? Um, yeah, absolutely. It's the Wild West. The the law hasn't really caught up with uh, with with how you should approach these things, and the, and the barriers you know the, um, to putting up a fake page are, are, are zero. You know, I could I could go and put a frog recruitment Facebook page up today. And all I have to do is uh, tick a box that says, yes, Mark Zuckerberg, I promise I really am frog recruitment. And that's that's the extent of the, the verification. I mean, if someone complains and I, and I prove not to be frog recruitment, they, they may well take it down. But, uh, you know, there's nothing stopping me. And, and, and on, uh, what's the, uh, to, to, to twist the old New Yorker car- cartoon, on Facebook, no one knows you're a frog. Right, right. And now tell me, um, we had Jane Davis on from the warehouse. Now, the warehouse... Uh, you t- tell us a wee because you know the backstory there about the warehouse Facebook page. Yeah, this is there's a, a bit of a, a section in the book about this. This is a, a fantastic example of um, people power, I guess. Uh, and this is um, the warehouse discovered that they had a, a company page on Facebook, and pretty quickly realised that no one in head office had actually started the damn thing. It was a very popular page. Uh, you know, staff are going there to talk about um, you know the, the the good and the and the bad of working at the warehouse, and they're sharing information and and having their questions answered sort of collaboratively. Um, and then, then customers started going there as well, saying, "Hey, where can I get some you know resin chairs for nine ninety nine or whatever whatever questions you'd want to ask at the warehouse?" Yet they didn't know who owned it, um, and it certainly wasn't the warehouse. It turned out it was a simply a, a, a particularly well engaged um, Christchurch uh, employee had you know off his own back decided to start this page. As I guess as an expression of his love for working in the place, uh, and this thing sort of took a life on its own. Um, when when they finally tracked him down, he, he he was actually more relieved, I understand, than uh, than sort of scared of getting into trouble. And they they took it off his hands. It turned out to be the best thing they ever did because uh, not long after that, the first Christchurch earthquake hit, and they f- suddenly discovered they've got uh, staff of mobile phones that aren't necessarily working, landlines that they can't use to connect with people because you know their homes are, are no longer occupied. And the Facebook page became an absolute information hub for the uh, for the warehouse. So it was a real, real success story. But it all began not because of corporate policy, but because of a uh, you know an individual who who wanted to use the medium in that way, which was pretty cool. Right now, so before we get to the nitty gritty, because we do, because there's people listening, they're very interested to hear your views on what they should do from a more grassroots level. But can you give us some examples of, um, let's say, the telecommunication industry, good and bad? Uses. If you just give us a, 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 a if I'm not putting it on the spot, telecommuni- uh, telecom versus Vodafone versus Orcom, let's say, about their, let's say, <coughs> social media campaigns, the good, the bad, and the ugly, if you can think of any responses to that. Yeah, I mean, firstly, I, I would say that thinking of social media as campaigns is probably problematic because, you know, one of the things people expect when they engage with your Facebook page or your um, you know, your Twitter account or whatever, is, a, is an ongoing relationship. So campaign thinking uh, within that context is cool, but to see social media as something you come and do for three months and leave is, is going to sort of burn a few bridges. But in terms of the telcos, yeah, that, that, that's an interesting one, and it's, it's best sort of illustrated by their approach to uh, Twitter or certainly their historical approach. Um, I think telecom, uh, you know, the, the telecom NZ um, Twitter account does a very, very good job of it. And the, the, the reason is this. Rather than entrust it to marketing or PR or whoever, what they, what they did is basically did a hands up. They said, okay, all you telecom people out there, who's into social media and who would like to you know, share the burden of being, being our Twitter people? So they got a bunch of people put their hand up and I think they've got eight people. None of them, or maybe one of them now, but originally none of them were marketers. They were programmers and uh, engineers and people from all across the business who happens to be familiar in the social media space. And they collaboratively share this Twitter account. They identify themselves by their initials so you know who you're communicating with, but they're speaking, they're speaking for telecom. So if a question comes in, they'll share the question, they'll work out who's the best person to do it, and then they'll answer. I think it's a really, really, really good approach. So do you think there's an industry, I mean, you being a professional writer, is there, is there an industry, let's talk about branding for a while, I mean, mm-hmm. I just, well, West, I could be wrong, but is there an industry growing, do you think, for great writers, you know, let's be honest, some of these magazines are finding it tough going, do you think there's an industry for great writers to offer services 
for consistency of the brand and all that sort of thing with the writing skills. So they do the Twitter, they do the Facebook, they do the LinkedIn. Every entry is professionally written. It's um, way off. I, I would, yeah, there's a bit of ghost tweeting and ghost posting going on, um, and certainly a couple of our. Um, you know, politicians are doing that, but I, I think they're doing it more for reasons of you know time management than anything else. I, I, as I said, this is this is where where brands are sort of equal to people, and I would like to believe that it's an opportunity for um, the brands to speak for themselves. You know, the um, I think it was the chief marketing officer of Starbucks last year said, um, you know, they're willing for their agency to be their their, their hands, their feet, their and, and part of their brains, but not their mouths. Um, you know, so she was she was arguing very strongly that in social media space you should speak for yourself, and, I, and I'm I'm, a, I'm an advocate of that too. I mean, you don't need to be polished, and and sometimes it's the sometimes it's the mistakes uh, that can you know re- reveal your humanity and actually you know build a, d- a deeper bond with with your with your customers. I mean, one of the the most famous social media stories is from around two years ago, Westpac Australia, the uh, the poor chap who was running their Twitter account one one slow, hot Friday, Sydney afternoon, um, made a mistake and swapped his, well, mistook his personal account for his Westpac account. And he tweeted as Westpac, uh, I am so over today, or I'm so over this week. And then immediately realized, oh my God, uh, I meant to tweet that to my friends and I've actually tweeted it to all my customers. The response to that is the interesting thing because almost immediately the uh, social media naysayers came in and say, right, that is why you should not, you know, use social media as an organisation because it it risks you making terrible mistakes and uh, you know looking like a jerk. Hard on the heels of that though was everyone chiming in and saying, well, you know, I'm over, I'm over today as well. It's been a hard week. Looking forward to the weekend, Mr. Westpac. What are you going to do? You know, you're going to have a few beers, have a barbie, and what it led to was a. Uh, a greatly increased level of engagement between Westpac and and the online community, which in a, in a country where banks are vilified is quite an achievement. Of course, the third thing that happened is a bunch of people came in and said, oh, you know, this was a Westpac stunt from the very beginning. They were just trying to make us make themselves look good, but I don't think they're that clever. Wow, that's that's interesting. Now, let's look. Let's get to the nitty-gritty. Let's look into your life. I quote you. You say in your book, I live in Twitter most days. Twitter versus Google. Vaughan, please discuss. Twitter versus Google. That's, a, that's an interesting... Well, uh, uh, three days ago, I would have said, what are you talking about? But um, since the launch of Google+, Plus, which... Um, oh, right. Of, of, yeah. yeah, Google+, Plus is the... Um, I guess it's it's Google Google's answer to Facebook, also Google's answer to Skype and Twitter and text messaging. Really interesting. Um, I, I haven't spent a lot of time in in Google Plus yet. I only got the invitation yesterday, so it's it's in, in trial. Uh, but I will I will talk about the um, the perils of geography, you know, because I, I said I, I you know I live in Twitter, and that's true. Uh, you know, that's where I'm I'm most sort of uh, comfortable uh, in the social space. I make an absolute effort because I'm a, you know, I'm, I'm working on behalf of my clients, not just myself. I make an absolute effort to go to other places, you know, like Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube, um, because I understand that Twitter is not representative of the general public, and that's a real danger: is is mistaking the sentiment on Twitter for the sentiment of your customers and uh, and acting on that sentiment. I mean, by some measures. The biggest social network in New Zealand is not Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or any of those. It's Trade Me. You know? right. Trade Me's got yeah, that's great. Yeah, tra- Trade Me's got 2.9 million registered users compared to just under 2 million for Facebook. But on their forums, um, and I at a conference the other day asked how many of the marketers had ever seen a Trade Me forum, and of the 30 or 40 people in the room, no hands went up. So, but on their forums. They're getting 25,000 posts per day, so you've got a huge number of New Zealanders are living their lives on Trade Me forums, their digital lives, and they're not just talking about you know where can I get some hubcaps for my Corolla. They're talking about the Kahui case. They're talking about the election. They're talking about MMP. They're talking about all all the things that people are talking about elsewhere, except they're doing it on Trade Me. So, as as a as a marketer or as a uh, anyone involved in social media, you need to be really really careful not to let your own um, biases and your own experiences colour, uh, you know, the recommendations you make. So, but when you say you live in Twitter, we, you know, I mean, we had a, a chap on oh, a couple of months ago, wonderful man called Bill Borman, 
Now, he started off with 50 LinkedIn cli- uh, contacts when he was made redundant. I think yep. he's now the fourth most influential blogger in the world on all things recruitment. Yep. And he said to us on this interview, he said, look, I don't, because I, we always ask what web pages, we love thought leaders such as yourself telling us where to go for information. He said, I don't use the web anymore. He said he uses Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. That's where yeah, he goes every day. That. Just, I mean, are you the same? Uh, no, I, I, I still do use the web a lot, but I certainly, um, I will use, I guess going back to this Twitter versus Google, um, to, to reframe that, I use Twitter as an expert um, knowledge engine, and I use it to give me advice and answers that uh, you know Google can't deliver at the moment. Uh, and, and the way that works is, you know, I've, over the, over the, the years, I've built up a, a follower and followed community of around you know three thousand people, and those people, they're not just random people I picked off a list. They're, they're, they're people that, in every case, I've I've chosen to follow and who've chosen to follow me, based on the things we say. Okay. And what that means is you end up with a unique network of, of people and a unique network of intelligence that is that is absolutely relevant to your interests. So if I want uh, you know, if I want a question, you know, typically about social media or about the other things I'm interested in, uh, you know, I'm, I'm looking at my puppy at the moment, puppies, um, aviation, uh, goat farming, uh, I can ask a question to my Twitter followers and there's a very, very good chance that I'm gonna get some experts, some trust Trustworthy expert advice in return. So he, yeah, he's got a point. It's uh, it's a very very powerful way to get uh, get real. It's, it's human search as opposed to uh, you know the Google algorithm. So pretty powerful. So how so how many? I mean, you sound like you're a very thorough Twitter user. How many hours a day would you spend on it, Vaughan? With you know thinking. I mean, obviously getting great responses and and also helping giving stuff. I suppose as a, as a part of it, is it? Um, well, I'm t- I'm tweeting at the moment. Uh, <laughs> It's it, you, you, you oh. fit it in. It's not something you go, okay, I'm going to spend an hour on Twitter. Um, you know, the the digital life. You know, if, if I'm if I'm um, you know waiting for the lights to change while I'm you know walking across the road, I'll I'll be on Twitter because I'll, I'll just be standing there. Uh, if I'm you know downloading something or, or thinking you know between windows on the computer, I'll be on Twitter as well. But it's it's it was described me once as the uh, as the mortar between the bricks of your day, which I think is a very accurate description. I mean, you could you could equally ask a smoker how he finds time to smoke. Wow. Okay. <laughs> you know. Or where where they or where where they can smoke now would be the biggest. Yeah, question. that that that's, um, that's more of a challenge, I think. Now, just yeah, but, moving to the last yeah, the part other, of our chat. Said, Sorry, go on. No, you you mentioned yep. um, you know asking and answering questions, which is a large part of it, and and that sort of um, sort of leads into I, I think the the two absolute principles of of participating in social media for um, for brands and for people. There's just two things you need to do, and and that's to be interesting and to be useful. And if you're not doing either oh, of those things, that you, you're wasting your time. Yeah, okay, okay, now let's, moving into the last part of our interview, there's a great uh, chapter you have in your book called Why This is the Only Chapter in This Book Worth Reading. As a lovely finish, can you just give us a once-over, lightly or deeply, no matter how much, what is that about that chapter and why should a recruitment marketer out there go straight and tweet your book? Yeah, okay, Why This is the Only Chapter in This Book Worth Reading, yeah, yeah. Well, I'd recommend, I'd recommend the other chapters, they're not bad. Um <laughs> the heart well of done. Yep. Yeah, the, the heart the heart of that chapter is basically uh it's just a couple of really simple frameworks for setting up your own social network. And you know, the the frameworks are neither here nor there, you know, the, the, there are lots of ways to, to attack it, but these ones are just from my personal experience. But the absolute heart of this chapter is just do it. You know? You could you could go to conferences, you could uh you know, uh <laughs> listen listen to podcasts. You could do all you like to, to learn about social media, or you could just do it. Uh, you know, get a get a blog, get a uh, Twitter account, get a Facebook account, get a, uh, a LinkedIn account, get a YouTube channel, do all those things. And if your company's not ready to do it, if you don't have the commitment or the time or the uh, you know the, the ongoing wherewithal to do it, do it personally. You know, a great way to become the best recruiter in social media is firstly to uh, you know to become the best uh, dog owner on social media in your own time and then just transfer those skills because they're the same skills you know you do it in your personal right, life so, and, and so I own a shoe shop you sh- your advice would be Mr. Shoe Shop owner go and open a Facebook account a LinkedIn account a Twitter account and what else 
Oh, if I if I had a shoe shop, golly, I'd be on uh, I'd be on YouTube. Uh, I'd get a uh, I'd get a really really simple cheap video camera. Flip used to make uh, such a camera. I think you can still buy them. Uh, every time uh, a shoe came in that I absolutely loved, I'd do a little uh, I'd do a little 45 second uh, video about it, showing people how cool it is. More importantly, showing people how excited I am about it. I'd upload that to my YouTube channel. I would link that to my blog. So, you know, blogging has never been easier, uh, you know, whether it's through Posterous, which has just got to be the easiest blog ever, or WordPress, I'd link that to my blog. And then I'd use other networks um, such as Twitter and Facebook to tell people I'd done it uh, and, the, and then join the conversation about what they think of the shoe. And then if I, I guess right. if I was getting jig, yep. jiggier with it, I'd, I'd, I'd start using that, you know, using those channels in a promotional way. So I'd, you know, I'd offer discounts or one-hour sales or, um, you know, buy one shoe get one shoe free sales and all that sort of stuff. You know, all, all those old marketing tricks. But I'd, I'd apply those new channels as well. And so just to finish off, I mean, what do you see in the future with social media? Is that a, is that definition going, going to change? As a, as a person who's such as yourself, who's a practitioner offering creative advice, uh, where do you see your career going? That's that's a really interesting. That's the one question I haven't prepared for. Where I, 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 the one thing I'm I'm sure about my career is that if you if you cling to one particular channel or one particular tool, uh, you're going to go down with it. Um, you know, we've we've spoken all day, all all this uh, interview about social media, but I, I need to be really clear that it's just one of the things that uh, you know that, that uh, the Goat Farm offers its clients, and one of the things I'm into. Uh, it's really really important, just in the same way as within social media, you need to be sort of channel agnostic. I think social media needs to be looked at alongside all the other ways to connect and uh, and communicate. And I think if you uh, you know if, if What's the old saying? If, if, if everything, if the only uh, if the only tool in your toolbox is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. So you end up giving bad advice. Uh, I, I think the trick is just to, uh, you know, do do exactly what I did when I, you know, moved into social media uh, a few years ago. Constantly keep looking for what's coming down the track. Um, be one step ahead of the clients. Understand it on their behalf, and uh, and find a place for it alongside what's already here. Right, great answer, Vaughan. And look, just before we finish, what where do you go each day you open your computer other than Twitter and Facebook and things? Where do you is there a book you, you you've read lately that you could put us on to or a great website that people go to to get the some, some great uh follow up information on what we've spoken about, other than tweet this book which we'll talk about in a minute. Yeah. Um do you know, I, I tend to look for inspiration and uh, idea fodder well outside um, what, I'm, what I'm doing professionally. You know, um, one, of, one of the things I talk about, the great way to have ideas is to, is to combine you know, existing snippets and facts in your head. And if all I think about is social media, uh, I'm going to have some pretty boring ideas. So, I mean, currently I'm reading a history of the English language by a guy called Melvin Bragg. Um, I'm reading the the, the biography of uh, Bernie Eccleston, who was uh, you know the Formula One sort of entrepreneur, and uh, a, a science fiction because I never read science fiction. So someone recommended at a conference I read the science fiction of Ian Banks. So I'm reading that. Uh, the la- the last thing I'll look to for social media inspiration is books about social media. <laughs> and now oh, I'm going to tell people why, why to download one. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. No, now why? Tell us just quickly the goat farm and tweet this book. How do we find you in the on the world wide web? To use an old fashioned term. Easy peasy. Um, the goat farm is just tgf.co.nz, um, or I believe if you just Google the goat farm, it'll it'll come up pretty highly. Um, and a uh, good place to see um, you know about the company and uh, latest um, radio content and video content that we're doing on other channels. Um, tweet this book is the name of the book there's a link to that on that page or again you can just google tweet this book and um, thanks to pretty high traffic over the last few months it ranks very highly uh, it's a free download and I think there's about 15 megs so uh, you know, if you've got a dial up connection you might want to go and do it at work uh, about a 15 meg download all you have to do to get the download is tweet or Facebook post that you have done so um, it's it's a, it's, a, it's a great system, but it's a little bit wacky because you're recommending the book to all your friends before you've even read it. So uh, hopefully I don't let you down. Oh, that's a very good answer. Now, look, on behalf of Frog Recruitment, 
we thank you, Vaughan, for a, a great chat today, which was I was excited about because it's full of nitty-gritty facts from a person who's in the creative industry, and I'm sure marketers and recruiters alike who are listening will be running off and starting to play in the areas you've said that they should go and play in. So thank you for your time, Vaughan, and have a great day. You're welcome. You too. Bye-bye.